As with most of my ghost town adventures, half the fun is the experience of the travel. Rural Nevada is such a beautiful place, and I really enjoy discovery of these areas. Most every one of them is new to me. Maybe in the past I've been to some of them, but never recorded the, uh, the event. But I found it really interesting to come up and not only experience what the miners and prospectors may have back in the day, but also it's a great experience just to research the history and look at some of the significant places that uh, some of these folks had explored. So I hope you guys enjoy these as well. Again, part of the adventure is getting there. That's why I'm filming the roadways. I like creating these videos to not only give you guys a peek into the past and help those that may not be physically able to get up into these areas. I'm so blessed that I can still have my health in order to go do these things and hopefully bring to you, the viewer, maybe an experience that you have not picked up on before and some perhaps even new historical facts that you did not know about. I hope they're educational, entertaining, and fun to watch. So sit back and enjoy a brief history of the area around Hamilton, Nevada. The White Pine Mining District was organized by a party of miners from Austin, Nevada, which is in the Reese River District, who were attracted to it by its tree-covered hills. Evidence that silver, lead, and copper ore were to be found led to the organization in 1865, during which year the first discovery of ore was made near the present site of Hamilton. The original ore discoveries had occurred in what was referred to as the Copper Belt on the western slope of the White Pine Mountains, a few miles east of Hamilton. But a rapid development did not take place there. The ore was too low grade to pay large returns, mainly due to the fact that it had to be hauled to Austin, almost 100 miles distance, for a reduction. In spite of the poor showing made, prospecting continued, and in 1866, mines were discovered on the eastern slope of the White Pine Mountain, which appeared to be promising. However, the big discoveries were on a place known as Treasure Hill. The story of the discovery of Hidden Treasure Mine goes as such. One night during the fall of 1867, a gentleman by the name of Leathers, who was a blacksmith for the Monte Cristo Company, was awakened by an Indian named Jim, who was ransacking his cabin for food. Leathers chased the Indian from his cabin and on returning to bed forgot the incident. A few days later, the Indian reappeared as at Leathers' cabin and offered him piece of silver ore as a peace offering. Leathers melted the ore and found a button of silver. This excited him and he convinced the Indian to show him where he found it. The Indian led them around the southern part of Maine White Mountains by way of a valley in which the town of Shermantown was later located. And after a great struggle with the elements, they reached the summit of Treasure Hill, where he showed them an abundance of ore as a result, the Hidden Treasure Mine was located on September 14 of 1867. The mine sold for $250,000. Rich as the ore appeared on the surface, it did not extend 100 feet in depth and the mine proved of but little value. A discovery which followed that of the Hidden Treasure was that of the Eberhardt Mine in December of 1867. It proved to be the greatest ever made in the district. The mine was discovered by T.E. Eberhardt of Austin, Nevada. It was without a doubt the riches of those on Treasure Hill, and $3.2 million worth of ore was removed in a short period of time in a very small area. The Eberhardt mine continued to produce about $500,000 for each of the years from 1872 to 1875, falling off to about 40000 in 1876 and 30000 in 1877. 
After 1878, very little was taken from the mine, and the failure to keep up with the production of the early, early years led the company in 1875 to start a tunnel into Treasure Hill. The tunnel reached a depth of 7,000 feet, but was finally abandoned when there was no ore of any value discovered. However, the discoveries of the hidden treasure and the Eberhardt mines were heralded far and wide and brought a rush of miners to Hamilton and the White Pine District from every mining community in the West. So great was the rush that a mining recorder of the district was obligated during 1869-1870 to keep three assistants, all of whom were kept busy recording claims. They recorded over 13,000 claims in just two years, by far the greater number being recorded within the first six months of the excitement, which was in the fall of 1868 and the beginning of 1869. The mines of the area were exceedingly productive over a period of 22 years. From 1865 to 1887, the mines produced a total of about $25 million in silver. Production continued somewhat steadily until 1887, although after 1876 it diminished each year. In 1907 and 1908, some development work was carried on, but since then the activity has just languished. Besides the production of lead between the years of 1902 and 1921, gold, silver, copper, lead, and zinc valued at a million dollars was taken from other mines in the district. Since 1921, there has been some development work carried on in the White Pine District, but nothing of noteworthy discovery has been made. When Hamilton was first located, it was known as Cave City, due to its proximity to a number of caves, some of which were used as dwellings by prospectors during the fall of 1867. With the discoveries of 1868 acting as a magnet, a rush was started to the district, which led to the formal laying out of the town of Hamilton on May 16 of 1868. The site was chosen for the town, is the geographical center of the district, and is located on the northern slope of Treasure Hill at an elevation of approximately 8,000 feet. So great was the excitement during the year of 1868 that every man who could get there went to the White Pine Mining District and consequently to Hamilton to examine the Eberhardt Mine. Besides the rush of population created by the rich discoveries, another thing that aided the growth of the town was the creation of White Pine County out of Lander County. This move occurred on April 1 of 1869 and Hamilton was designated as the county seat, which helped to make it the governmental and business center for all the surrounding mining camps. From no population in 1865 to about 1,000 in 1868 and an estimated 10,000 in the latter part of 1869 and the early part of 1870. That was the record of the bustling mining town. New arrivals in the spring of 1869 numbered 50 to 100 a day. Typical of the early western mining camps, the first frame building to be erected in Hamilton was a saloon. This was built by King and Ivers in June of 1868, a month after the town had been laid out. Soon after, the post office and Wells Fargo Express office was established, and the town was well on its way to becoming a hustling city. The first school was opened in July of 1869, in the fall of that same year, a $4,000 schoolhouse was built. In 1870, the city was improved by the construction of a $50,000 brick courthouse. The building of a county hospital also added to the appearance of the town. One of the largest private enterprises was the Withington Hotel, built in 1869. Allison's history after 1871 seems rather dull, when compared with the lusty years of 69 and 70. 
The decline in mining as the years went by could not help but have a debilitating effect on the town. And this fact, coupled with the disastrous fire in 1873, nearly spelled the doom of Hamilton. Previous to 1873, Hamilton had a few fires that losses ranging from $200 to $5,000. But on the morning of June 27, 1873, the main portion of the town, including all but two of its business houses, were entirely destroyed by fire. The fire started by Alexander Cohn, who had set fire to the back part of a cigar store in an attempt to collect the small amount for which his store was insured. The fire spread quickly and soon the main part of the town was in ruins, partly due to the lack of water available for fighting fires. Cohn was convicted in sentence in the same year to seven years in a state prison. The fire destroyed property worth about $500,000, and it dealt Hamilton a blow from which it never recovered. The production from the mines was declining at the same time, and rather than rebuild, businessmen moved on to other promising centers. In 1875, the city was disincorporated, having at the time of the disincorporation assets of $1.75 and an outstanding indebtedness of almost $3,000. The bank was moved from Hamilton to Eureka in September of 1877. and it was followed by a general clearing out of the remaining population who were headed in the same direction as the bank. This series of unfortunate incidences, along with the petering out of the mines, had practically depopulated the once prosperous town. The final blow came in 1885 when on January 5th the courthouse burned. By an act of the Nevada legislature, and the county seat of White Pine County was moved from Hamilton to Ely on January 28 of 1887, and Hamilton took its place among the ghost towns of Nevada. Ah, my favorite place, rural Nevada. I'm standing among some ruins in an area known as Hamilton, Nevada. A lot of uh, rich silver ore was founded in this area in the 1860s, the town was established in 1868, and its boom was short-lived. They claimed that this whole area had close to 12,000 people in it, but within a couple of years, it had declined to down 3,000 people. And another year after that, so in about three years, they were down to about 500 people. Then fires swept through and destroyed many of the buildings. And because the businesses were no longer in existence, much of the area did not get rebuilt. So let's go walk among the, uh, the ruins here and see what we can find. I thought this would be a good location in the video to discuss the availability of water. The supply of water in the immediate area was extremely limited. In some of the neighboring canyons, there were streams and springs affording water to mills located near them. But until the pumping works of the White Pine Water Company began operations, there was considerable difficulty in obtaining enough water, even for domestic uses, not only in Treasure City, where there is no natural source of supply, but also in Hamilton, where it was very scarce. The White Pine Water Works was organized in San Francisco with a large capital, projected works on a truly magnificent scale for the purpose of furnishing water to the towns of Hamilton and Treasure City, and to the mills in the vicinity. Their source of supply is a spring found in a canyon on the east side of the range of mountains that is immediately east of Applegarth Canyon. This spring, which furnishes an abundant supply, was nearly a thousand feet below the summit of the pass over which the water must be carried in order to reach the Applegarth Canyon. To pump the water from the spring to the pass, there was great capacity that had to be built, which used the Cameron or Stoddard steam pumps. The steam cylinders of these pumps are 22 inches in diameter and 5 foot stroke, and the water cylinders 10 inches in diameter. The pipe or column through which the water is forced is 12 inches in diameter 
and made of riveted boilerplate in sections 20 feet long. The water was pumped from this point in a single lift, about 470 feet to a reservoir, where a similar pumping station was established. From the reservoir, water was pumped again 465 feet. This was making the entire lift 935 feet. In all, there was about 10,487 feet of water line that was buried for protection from frost. The total capacity by all these works was stated by their engineer at 2.5 million gallons per day. The capacity at the source of the springs is said to be greater than 5 million gallons per day. The cost of the work is stated to be $300,000. That equates to about $7 million today. Most inflation calculators are not very accurate before 1913, so this is only a guesstimate. The price of $7 million seems a little low to me. The system began running in October of 1869. Although Hamilton, at its peak, was a leading town in the White Pine Mining District and in the county, there were three other towns in the vicinity that deserved notice because they contributed somewhat to the general growth of Hamilton. These were Treasure City, Eberhard, and Shermantown. Treasure City was located on the western slope of Treasure Hill, near the top at an elevation of 9,100 feet. The first cabin built there was erected by Murphy and Marchin in November of 1867, at the time when they were the owners of the Hidden Treasure Mine. The rush of 1868 led to the layout of the town in April of 1868, and in less than a year it had a population of 6,000 people. In June of 1874, the main portion of that town was burned, and it was not rebuilt. By 1878, the town was nearly abandoned, like its sister city in Hamilton, and today it's deserted and only a skeleton of a few buildings remain. Eberhardt was located in Applegarth's Canyon at the foot of the southern slope of Treasure Hill. It was five miles southeast from Hamilton and was founded as a result of the building of the Stanford and the Eberhardt and Aurora Mills. Like Treasure City, the population declined with the cessation of mining activity. Shermantown was located near the mouth of the canyon between White Pine Mountains and Treasure Hill, about five miles south of Hamilton. It was a good mill site, and five quartz mills and four furnaces were erected there in 1868 and 69. In the fall of 1869, it had between four and 5,000 people as its population. It was incorporated the same year in 1881, it had dwindled until one family lived there. The road to Shermantown kind of got washed out and real brushy for my truck, full-size truck. So I'm going to walk up here. I think it's about a half mile. And check out Shermantown and see what kind of things we can find. Fun to go hiking in these areas, too. Just got to be careful when you're by yourself. Today, Shermantown lies deserted. All of these towns in their heyday had what seemed to be a very bright future. But like all mining camps, that future depended on the mines. When the mines failed, the need for the towns disappeared. Their histories are typical of hundreds of other towns in the West and in Nevada.
Well, I can't think of a much better place to have lunch than up on top of this ridge. Little breezy, but the views are fantastic. Gonna have a little bit of a lunch here, take a break. You can see out over the valleys in that direction behind me. Some more views that way. My uh, ice chest is open and ready for me to fix whatever's in there for lunch. This is known as the Big Smoky Mill. It was placed in operation in May 24 of 1869. It had 20 stamps, and they claim it cost $60,000 to build. That equates to almost $2 million today. This is known as Mourner's Point Cemetery. Here are a few random photos of the headstones. You know, as I walk around these ruins from the buildings that were built uh, more than 150 years ago, I'm reminded how remote this area is even today. I can only imagine how hard it was to live out in these areas, especially during the winter. This area right here is known to be extremely cold and get lots of snow, pretty miserable in long winters. But I like to keep the history alive. I love roaming around these ruins. It almost makes me feel like I can hear people, hear the noise, hear the rumbling of the town, hearing the buzz of all the mining operations going on. It's a lot of fun to get out here and do this exploration. I hope you guys were able to enjoy this with me. And again, thanks for watching all this. Appreciate your viewership.